This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Marx, Towards the Center of Possibility, by Kojin Karatani, edited by Gavin Walker. Originally published in 1974, Kojin Karatani's Marx, Towards the Center of Possibility, has been among his most enduring and pioneering works in critical theory. Written at a time when the political sequences of the new left had collapsed into crisis and violence, with the widespread political exhaustion for the competing sectarian visions of Marxism from 1968, Karatani's Marx takes on insights from semiotics, deconstruction, in the reading of Marx as a literary thinker, treating capital as an intervention in philosophy that could be read as itself a theory of signs. Marx is unique in this sense, not only because of its importance in post-68 Japanese thought, but also because its heterodox reading of Marx that debuts in this text, centered on his theory of the value form, will go on to form the basis of Karatani's globally influential work. Marx, Towards the Center of Possibility, by Kojin Karatani, edited by Gavin Walker. Out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. New York City's inequalities have defined the course of this plague. It's hitting working-class Black and immigrant New Yorkers the hardest. The people who live in the smallest, most crowded quarters, who must work to eat, and thus who must use a subway system abandoned by the sheltering-in-place middle and upper classes to get to their jobs. Today's New York is a man-made disaster, crafted amid the fiscal crises of the 1970s by the harsh austerity and neoliberal model that bankers, corporate elites, and the Ford administration imposed in response. My guest today is historian Kim Phillips Fine, the author of Fear City, New York's Fiscal Crisis and the Rise of Austerity Politics. She first brings to life the New York that came before the crisis, a city with social democratic aspirations, where militant public sector unions and the people that they served fought to build a place with good jobs, free higher education for all, an expansive public health system, and so much more. But American and global capitalism were already undergoing a massive transformation in the 1960s as the city, pushed by its organized people, extended its social democratic promise to meet growing human needs, including those of the huge numbers of black migrants arriving from the South and of Puerto Ricans who had departed from their homes in the Caribbean colony. It was just then, as huge numbers of poor people of color were arriving in New York, that jobs and middle-class whites were leaving to the suburbs and far beyond, and so the city's tax base was leaving too, hoarded in the sprawling suburbs of an intensely segregated metropolis. Throughout the 60s, New York's leaders bridged this gap by taking on debt. When economic crisis hit in the 70s, bankers stopped buying that debt, and Republican President Gerald Ford refused to help. Elites held the city hostage, demanding austerity and the evisceration of the city's social democracy in exchange for access to the credit that the city needed to survive. 
The economic reaction was a thoroughly political reaction, too, that curbed popular and union power and that sharply curtailed what everyone thought was possible, what people expected and aspired to expect from government. When New York ultimately did come back, emerging from those crisis years that became a staple of pop culture nostalgia, it came back a changed city. It was a city that no longer served the diverse working class, but rather finance and real estate and yuppies. It was a new order protected by police and prisons. A city that had once been at the forefront of decommodifying the provision of services that meet basic human needs became a city infamous for the rent being too damn high and where more than 110,000 students are homeless. A city governed in significant part by social movement demands that aspired to take care of everyone became a city governed by and for the rich. Today, COVID is disproportionately killing the very same working class people that neoliberal New York has long exposed to sickness, destitution, and death. It is killing the very working class people that are keeping New York from collapsing entirely under the weight of coronavirus. In the 1970s, New York was an epicenter of an economic crisis that would remake the entire domestic and global political economy to serve the rich and capital. New York was a model. Its social democratic experiment was spectacularly destroyed as an example to others. It was a lesson that there is no alternative. That lesson would be repeated again and again from the debt-leveraged imposition of the Washington Consensus on the Global South to the capital strike that brought French President Francois Mitterrand's socialist project to a swift end. We have seen creditor discipline make examples of Detroit, Greece, Spain, Puerto Rico, and countless other places since. Today, New York is the epicenter of the country's coronavirus crisis. What decides who lives and who dies isn't just nature taking its toll. Rather, a map of the city's death count is a map of the unequal city that neoliberalism has created. Look at what's happening, for example, in the heavily immigrant neighborhoods of Elmhurst and Corona, Queens. Look at where people are dying and who is dying this is what happens when we have a government that in ordinary times is charged with little beyond sort of ensuring people's mere survival. In a pandemic, our system can't even get close to ensuring even that. In other words, we all, all of us in New York and everywhere else, still live and do politics in the world created out of the crises of the 1970s. The good news is that so many of us are fighting so hard to break free of that world and to create a new one in its place. Much of that world that we're fighting for, in fact, looks a lot like what New Yorkers were trying to build in the 1960s. Free higher ed, homes for all, health care for all. Which brings me in a somewhat roundabout way to what do we do about the Bernie movement now? This campaign has been about fighting for a new world that was, in a way, a world that was taking shape in the New York City of Bernie's youth. And though we've fallen short, the end of the formal campaign does not by any means, mean the end of the movement. Huge numbers of people, particularly young people, are never returning to politics as usual. And that is more true than ever in this extremely unusual moment. I wrote an essay at Jacobin arguing that Bernie must preserve the volunteer system, 
the campaign infrastructure that we all did so much to build. He must preserve it and then retool it for social movement ends now that the race for the nomination has all but concluded. Bernie also remains on the ballot, and I do hope and believe that people will independently organize to ensure that he gets votes and delegates from the upcoming primaries. Finally, volunteer leaders are circulating a petition calling for the preservation of the campaign's organizing systems. I'll link to that and to my essay in the show notes. If you are a Bernie volunteer, please sign and circulate. Super quick before we get started. We can only do all of this work and make all of these podcasts for you because you, our listeners, support us at patreon.com slash the dig. We are spending a bunch of time and money right now on two new projects. One is a limited run series on life and politics amid COVID. Two are dig book clubs that we are helping you all start. If you are interested in submitting to the COVID series or in joining or leading a book group, you can find out more info on all of that at thedigradio.com. That's thedigradio.com. Anyhow, we are spending the money that you give us wisely. And so, if you have not done so already, and you have a stable source of income and can afford it, please contribute what you can at patreon.com slash the dig. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash the dig. Finally, our audio quality isn't quite as hot these days because we cannot hire producers to record our guests because that is a super socially proximate activity. So this interview gets a little shaky audio-wise, but is still totally audible for a few minutes near the middle. Anyhow, we are working on technological fixes and are doing our best, given the circumstances. Okay, here is Kim Phillips Fine, who teaches American history at New York University. She is the author of Fear City, New York's Fiscal Crisis and the Rise of Austerity Politics, and of Invisible Hands, The Businessmen's Crusade Against the New Deal. Kim Phillips Fine, welcome to The Dig. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Finance, new liberals, conservatives, they destroyed New York City's social democracy, not only to protect creditors' economic interests, but to remake the city's political economy and also to set an example for the entire country. You write that for President Gerald Ford, quote, as for much of the nation, New York City stood for urban liberalism, an example of the central role that government might play in addressing problems of poverty, racism, and economic distribution. New York represented the fullest realization of the confident liberalism that dominated American politics. I want you to set the stage by explaining the urban social democracy that New York was building, a city that, quote, almost seemed to proclaim a right to happiness and pleasure, even for people insignificant in terms of wealth and power. That was the promise implicit in the ordinary, everyday monuments of the local health clinics, the free museums, the affordable transportation, a right to belong to the city and to have the city belong to you. We know the crisis years well because they've become iconic in film and in popular culture. So, so start by describing this New York City that came before, the, the New Deal and Great Society's leftward edge, perhaps 
one of this country's boldest efforts yet at building a humane society. New York City in the post-war years was a very unique place in the context of American history. And and there are a number of things that set the city at this moment apart. It's a city with, with very high union density, as it still is today, but higher still then. It's a city that has a strong and very vibrant left-wing political scene, which exerts a kind of pressure on um, local politics. It is also a city that has, especially thanks to the New Deal um, and to Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia's relationship with President Roosevelt, had gotten a lot of federal money during the New Deal years to expand public housing, um, to expand public investment in infrastructure of all sorts. And combining all of this with a tradition of kind of of local social welfare activism that goes back um, to the early 20th century, the city going into the post-war years developed a very unique set of public institutions and a unique investment, unique in the American context, in developing kind of the the infrastructure of a democratic city, small d democratic political entity. And I I think, you know, there is a kind of large, um, a major investment in public health and public health infrastructure. You know, there are about 20, I think a couple more than 20 at the peak public hospitals operating in the city. This is in addition to a network of public health clinics that run throughout the five boroughs. And in addition to that, to kind of a investment in public health through the schools. You know, there were, in addition to nurses, other kinds of health checkups that happened for city school children. There and were... Three public nursing schools, I believe. Mm-hmm. There's a, 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 a pu- the public health department of the city is actually engaged in various kinds of epidemiological research um, and is kind of seen around the country as one of the most ambitious public health departments, you know, both in developing programs and also in trying to think about and understand what, what you need for public health in a city. So there's all, all of that on one on, on the one hand, and then there's also institutions like CUNY, the City University of New York, which was tuition free since its inception in the 19th century, but which grows dramatically over the post-war years. You know, adding new campuses, expanding existing campuses, creating you know both four-year and two-year schools throughout the boroughs, and ultimately in the in the late 1960s adopting a policy of open admissions whereby anybody who graduates from high school in New York can attend can attend CUNY, again, tuition-free, is, is guaranteed admission at one of the campuses throughout the city. So here, too, is a kind of a very ambitious investment in higher education as a, a kind of a public good for anyone in New York. This is layered on top of the, the different kinds of public resources that the, the, you know, the city's library system, its transit system, which actually also becomes fully publicly owned in 1940. Um, previously, you know, part of it had been privately, a privately owned system, but the city takes over the operation of the subway lines entirely. And there's this very powerful commitment to keeping the fares very low. And the, so there's the, the transit system, the library system, the city school system, which has, there are different problems in the city school system, but one of the things that is notable about it in the post-war years is that there's a very strong emphasis on music and art education in schools. People recollect schools giving them, you know, instruments to use for free in schools. There's a, a remarkable investment in different kinds of, you know, in, in, the, in the public sector of the city, the public infrastructure of the city, with a certain vision of the way that this might connect to the lives of ordinary New Yorkers. And I think one of the things that is a little bit, you know, this, this was never a perfect system, obviously. There was an intense kind of racial segregation in the city all throughout the post-war years. The city is becoming more and more a city of people of color over these years. 
Uh, the, the, I think the, the proportion of people of color in New York is is pretty low at the end of World War II, but the city's black and Latino population greatly increases between 1945 and 1970. And it, you know, so and the public resources are not you know kind of distributed in some perfect way in the city at this point. It remains a city very divided by race and class. But nonetheless, I think this public investment is, you know, it was a remarkable accomplishment and a, a kind of a vision of city life that was, you know, both made a, a tremendous difference in the experiences and social mobility and culture of the city and also represented a kind of aspiration. So the places where it wasn't perfect, people pushed on it to try to get more and to improve the public sector um, and to improve it, to expand it, to develop it, to strengthen it. So I think that's one of the things you see happening in the city all over, all throughout the 40s, 50s, 60s. You write, quote, the city's politics reflected its economic structure, and, and in part because, quote, the industrial nature of the city meant that there was a clear economic rationale to the investment in public goods. The subways got workers to their jobs, the clinics kept them healthy, and the libraries and universities offered skills training in an avenue for upward mobility and the purchasing power that went with it. Explain your analysis a bit more here, why it was that industrial New York put working class New Yorkers at the center of its politics in a way that the New York of finance and real estate that would supplant it has not. Yeah, I think that the so the, the city's economic structure in the 40s and 50s was a much more it was New York was really at this point much more of a blue collar industrial manufacturing city. And we don't always think of it that way partly because New York was always different from some place like Detroit or the south side of Chicago. Um, in the its its manufacturing base was one composed of small factories, smaller employers. It was a, a diverse base with many different industries represented: electrical manufacturing, garments, printing, food and drink manufacturing and distribution. So it's a much the, the ports, of course. It, it, it's not as dominated by a single industry the way that Detroit is by the auto companies or by a few very, very large employers, again, like Ford, Ford Chrysler, General Motors, or the steel companies uh, someplace like Chicago. It has a, a kind of heterogeneity that I think is, you know, kind of helps – Part of what it means is that the employers, the companies, each of them is actually pretty small and they are much less well organized in some ways than the workers who work at the companies. And so their political weight in terms of the city government is not as profound. And then on the other hand, they're, in comparison to the city driven by finance and real estate or in a way by other kinds of white collar jobs too, the people who work at these companies live in the city. They're not commuting in from the suburbs, at least at first or early in the period. And they are, there's a kind of just a, a way in which the, they're not, their backgrounds are in some ways not so dramatically different from those of their employers. And there, there isn't the same sense of a, of a bifurcated city as will come to pass later on, where you have people working in, you know, kind of very high income industries who are really set apart dramatically from the rest of the city. So I think there's more work that could be done on this, actually, and that, that people are doing on both industrial New York and then on actually the deindustrialization of New York. Um, Andy Battle, from who has just finished his dissertation at CUNY, is working on deindustrialization in the city in this period and the way that that helps to set the stage for, I mean, I think part of what I take from his work is the way that that changes the city over the post-war years and opens up the space for the fiscal crisis to happen, both economically but also politically, that it changes the balance of forces, the balance of power in the city overall. But I think, in a way, the whole the, the vision of New York as a, a, a industrial city 
And then the question of what happens to New York as it deindustrializes is one of the kind of the major themes of the period. I would also point to Josh Freeman's book, Working Class New York, which you know is it was very influential for me and which helps to paint, you know, kind of even more fully the picture of New York at of this kind of this this working class social democratic city at its peak. The new politics that you describe emerging from the 1970s crisis is emerging as well from this broader new economic order that was taking shape before the crisis, including very much have it relating to the spatial dynamics of that order. You had capital and middle class and affluent taxpayers moving, which meant jobs and tax revenue moving, which created this whole new and sharply segregated political and economic order of, of, of segregated polities divided between city and suburbs. And even bigger picture, you have the entire reorientation of American political economy towards the Sun Belt. But you write that New York in the 1960s pushed forward in, in building this social democracy, even as its tax base was disappearing, even as these massive transformations were already well underway. And one thing that that stuck out to me was how Mayor Abraham Beam, as the crisis hit in the 70s, that he initially persisted in believing that that business in general and banks in particular, that they should and and would, if if he just scolded them enough, uh, behave as citizens of New York. And it really came across, and the characters in your book really jump right off the page, really he portrayed their failure to do so as as a moral failing, as a disloyalty. But the banks, the banks were already playing by by new rules, and Beam didn't understand that. And and it's not just that that jobs had moved away, but which I knew about before reading your book, but that the globalization of finance had changed banking in a way that made the city much less powerful vis a vis banks, which in turn made tax-exempt municipal bonds way less important to their profits. It, explain this, how these deep changes that were already well underway were suddenly revealed by the crisis when it hit, and how that all shaped the terms on which the crisis was re- resolved. Right. Well, there's a lot to, to speak to there, but I guess I'll start with the last part about the banks and about the financing of New York City, and then maybe I'll move back to Beam and also the politics of the 60s and what's changing there. So I think, you know, one of the things that the way that the story of the fiscal crisis is typically told or has been typically told has is really emphasized, it has been a, a morality story about the problems of liberalism and the problems and irresponsibility of New York City's government that it was simply, it was, it was overspending, it was spending too much. The city leaders were not able to cut back. They continued to develop different, you know, rather than cut back, they, they came up with various ways to sort of disguise in the budget how much they were actually overspending, and they tried different techniques to borrow more and more aggressively, and that's what led to the fiscal crisis. And we can talk a little more about, you know, I, I don't, there are parts of that that I think are, you know, have have some truth to them. But one of the things that has gotten, I think, really not enough attention is the the way that the the attitudes of banks and the context for the banks that are underwriting New York's debt they are actually really changing at this moment as well. And this is in in the late '60s and early '70s. Many banks are. I, I guess I would I would point to a couple of different things. One is that banks are really expanding their overseas operations at this point in a way that means that they have the tax advantage that they obtain from municipal bonds is declining. They have more of their income outside of American taxes to begin with, and so the the benefits to holding these bonds, which you don't have to pay in, um, taxes on the income, the interest income from them, is not as significant as it has been previously. And and that's in the context of that bigger story of of the oil, yeah, oil but, profits being funneled into Latin American debt. Exactly. 
yeah, there's kind of a larger the kind of a larger context of the petrodollars and declining bank regulations in general, and also the the turn towards the increased interest in finance as a site of profit generating activity, especially as United States manufacturing appears more and more fraught and difficult. And all of these together, I think, taken together, they transform the financial industry in many, many different ways. But one of the things that they do is they make banks much less interested in financing cities like New York or, or, or in carrying municipal debt in general. And the proportion of municipal bonds that are held by commercial banks declines over the course of the early 70s. Um, this is across the board, not just for New York. And this is kind of right at the same moment when not just New York again, but many cities are actually trying to expand their borrowing. Cities and also states and some cities and states tried to set up separate entities that would kind of float bonds that were meant to specifically be used for industrial development. Or There's a whole – this is at a moment when there's an increased demand for public borrowing. And I think this change in context is important to understand, again, part of why the fiscal crisis emerged when it did. There was actually an earlier – in the early 60s, New York almost goes into a fiscal crisis and similar to that, which happens in the 70s, but everybody walks back from it. And there are, again, there are different reasons for that. The advent of the Great Society programs, the war on poverty, that changes the context for New York. But I think part of it is that the banks actually are acting quite differently by the time you get to the mid-70s. And yes, there's a real way in which people like Mayor Abraham Beam, who have come up within this particular vision of the city, this particular kind of constellation of institutions. You know, Beam himself had gone to City College. He came from a very poor family on the Lower East Side. He had been a lifelong, you know, as soon as he came into politics, he sort of worked his way up the Democratic machine. Beam was no kind of political, he didn't have much of a political theory. He was not a very inspiring or charismatic speaker or person, but he did have this kind of faith and confidence in how the world worked, and which is shaken by the fiscal crisis. And as part, part of what he just, he doesn't quite understand how the banks can be acting this way, how they can say they won't finance the city any longer. He's not a liberal crusader like John Lindsay, but he is very much a creature of the social democratic New York that he came up in. Yeah, exactly. He's not a, and you know, and, and I think that he's not a, he's not a crusader. He's not a, you know, kind of morally inspiring politician. And I think this is actually important because his response to the crisis as it emerges is to, he does kind of try to avoid addressing it as an actual crisis or problem. He does, he kind of turns away from it. There, there are these different efforts to expand the city's borrowing, which are without a clear sense of what the end game is going to be or what the solution is going to be. And you know, one of the things which I think could have meant a different outcome for the city would have been, you know, if you can imagine hypothetically a leader who would have been able to articulate a vision of what New York was doing and to press for political support for that vision. You know, Beam's version of that was to say, oh, there can't be a problem. There can't be a problem. This is the city of New York. We can't possibly go bankrupt. You know, there is no problem here, really. And, you know, in the end, that wasn't going to be, as it became increasingly clear that, in fact, it could, that it, just, it wasn't a defense for what, for the positive elements of that vision either. And because of that, instead, he becomes the face of austerity that he initially fiercely opposed, but ultimately not only carried out, but defended. Yeah. No, I think he does become really, he comes under a tremendous pressure to make a set of cuts that are painful to him to make, but he has no real capacity to offer an alternative to them. You said actually one thing I, I wanted to go back to actually your point about the 60s. Another, you know, a kind of re remarkable thing about, I mean, another kind of interesting part of the story is the way that 
yes, the city's public sector continues to expand over the course of the 1960s. And at this point, there is, you know, some of the economic problems are already beginning to become apparent. Deindustrialization in the city is underway. Lindsay tries both to recruit, uh, I mean, Lindsay is committed to kind of reconfiguring Manhattan so that it is more oriented towards white collar employers and finance and tourism. But he also does, he kind of does some work to try to retain manufacturing companies in the outer boroughs. But there is, despite this, there's a kind of, the city does actually continue to expand spending over the course of the 60s. And I think this also is important for thinking about this, because a lot of that spending is driven by organizing that emerges in one way or another out of the civil rights and black freedom movements. And the transformations of CUNY, for example, are on the one hand, I think, a remarkable accomplishment, but they're also met with a lot of hostility, both from, um, well, some from white ethnic New Yorkers, but also from people who had a commitment to a different vision of CUNY, one which they thought was more kind of purely meritocratic, and they're not so sure about having it transform in these ways and offer education, offering education to all. So some of the changes of the 60s are also, you know, I think ones that push at what the question of who is this local welfare state for, who does it benefit, what is its role and function in the city, and there's a way in which there's a kind of division about that uh, going into the 70s that I think is also kind of lays the groundwork for the emergence of the fiscal crisis. And maybe also, or to put it a different way, lays the groundwork for the failure to effectively confront and 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 stop the reaction to the fiscal crisis cuz the great society in a partial and limited and deeply contradictory sense was in an effort to universalize the new deal state in part by fixing its racist exclusions and for for that to have succeeded in the face of the crisis it would have required a multiracial working class coalition but that never took shape instead and i think what one thing you're you're pointing out is that pre-existing racist divisions within the New Deal order facilitated the, the the shift from a more universal welfare state to this just kind of plain welfare as the stigmatized redistribution of goods to racialized, undeserving others. Do, do, do you think it was the the very kind of segregation embedded within the New Deal social compact that made the survival of the Great Society so difficult to to preserve in the face of crisis? I think you have to lay a lot of the responsibility on the, I mean, it's not just the structures of the New Deal, but also the particular ways that the Great Society was trying to address those that I think, you know, did open up, they, they made them harder, they made those programs especially difficult to defend. The means tested the conception of those programs as, you know, kind of means tested programs directed only at very poor people who it is easy for middle class or white Americans to view as somehow innately pathological or different. I think that structure of those programs was part of what opens them up to to failure. But yeah, I, mean, I think in other ways you can trace it back to some of the weaknesses inherent in the New Deal itself. I mean, it's interesting in New York. The the way a lot of, a lot of the so so the um, you know the expansion of CUNY or the very active welfare rights movement in the city. I mean, these are very lively and ambitious and um, dynamic social movements. They aren't you know, the, the way in which these programs come about is not so much through a top down approach, but they are responses to these very kind of, you know, crusading and intense and passionate mobilizations. So, yeah, I think that's important to remember also. You write that conventional, the conventional wisdom blames spendthrift liberals like Mayor John Lindsay and even maybe more Abraham Beam, even though he was a totally different sort of political character than, than Lindsay. It blames unionized public sector workers and the poor and diverse public that they served. And 
one thing I was thinking about a lot reading your book is how the story you tell really exemplifies what I think is a core feature of neoliberalism, which is a dislocation between the scales at which power operates and at the scale at which it's visible. So you have local elected officials who have all the responsibility for imposing the austerity and who become the target of protests. Meanwhile, the scale at which real power resided was so much higher up and harder to comprehend and kind of wrap one's arms around because you had the the emergency financial control board and then above them the federal government and then even more abstractly the entire ascendant system of financialized capitalism <laughs> and so public sector unions did and these public sector unions as 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 you mentioned you know uh, or I don't know if we've talked about it yet but as you detail in the book come out of this really powerful s- social unionism movement of of the 60s and they did initially try to target First National Bank and try to identify finance as the villain. And identification of of the enemy is so critical in politics. But that didn't really stick or take hold. So what what happened in terms of, of the scale that workers and everyday New Yorkers were resisting on and then the scale that power was operating at? And how how did that all shape how the crisis was framed and how blame was apportioned? Well, I think that's a great question. That's also a really interesting way of putting it or thinking about neoliberalism and these sort of layers of power. Well, part of what happens in the fiscal crisis, or so, so when it becomes evident that, you know, as as the the crisis becomes increasingly manifest, or as it becomes clear that as banks start to say that they aren't going to continue to underwrite the city's debt any longer. They're not going to help it sell its municipal bonds. They're not going to buy the bonds themselves, and the city isn't going to be able to keep borrowing. This triggers the, the fiscal crisis because the city actually needs to be able to keep borrowing in order to conduct its daily operations. So when it's clear it won't be able to any longer, this sets off a, a chain of events where it, 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 you know, unless some solution is found, the city will have to declare bankruptcy or default on its debt. And there was a lot of question, what would that actually have meant? What would it have looked like? Because a city is different from a corporation. You can't just sort of fold up shop and go home. There are, you know, they're all, they're, all the essential functions of the city have to continue to operate. So how do you do that in the conditions of bankruptcy? Magnifying this, the, the kind of bankruptcy law for cities was actually kind of antiquated and out of date. The federal law governing it said that you had to have all creditors get together and vote you know, as for, on any kind of repayment plan. Um, this was just not feasible. There wasn't even any comprehensive list of who all the city's creditors were. There were thousands and thousands of them. So the crisis kind of emerges over the summer of 1975, and it becomes immediately clear that what the city is, the city comes under a tremendous amount of pressure to make a set of steep cuts to its public sector. And we can talk more about kind of how this played out, how this, you know, kind of what what happened, but after some, some resistance, both from the city government and then also a wave of protest from city workers ranging from wildcat strikes to, yes, a set of protests that kind of target the banks in particular and say the banks are driving the city to this. They have to stop. Um, They have to continue to finance the city. The banks, in turn, say it's not our fault. There's just no market for your debt any longer. We can't, you know, we're not going to do it ourselves. No one will buy your debt across the country. The city comes under increasing pressure to make a set of budget cuts. And it does. It lays off about 20% of its workforce over the subsequent three years. This affects almost every aspect of the city's public sector. Hospitals are closed. Local health clinics are closed. The school day actually is shortened by 90 minutes. You know, all of the art and music programs are cut back to the bone. Many teachers are laid off. Class sizes go up to, in some cases, 45 or 50 kids per class. There are a wave of school closures, which are actually, uh, at least in Manhattan, they're really focused on Harlem and Harlem schools. There are, you know, the libraries are cut, hours are cut, 
all, all through the city's public sector, there is this profound contraction. Police officers are laid off. Firefighters are laid off. And this, again, is met with a, you know, a wave of protest, but, but the, a lot of that protest is very local and defensive in nature. So people in a particular neighborhood will organize to keep a fire station open. People will demonstrate to stop their local school from closing. There is a wave of protest within the CUNY system to keep campuses that were threatened with closure from shutting down. But many of these struggles have a lot of trouble working together or mounting a more a, a broader scale political response to what's happening. And I think that is partly because there isn't a clear sense of how to do that, who to target. It reminds me a little bit of the, you know, the, the famous scene in early in The Grapes of Wrath where, you know, the Jodes are losing their land and some, one of the Jodes, I forget which one, comes out and says, you know, who can I shoot? And it's not really clear who is, who is to blame. So I think that is actually, I think you're, you're quite right. There's something about the fiscal crisis where people have a sense that something terrible is happening and that things are changing in ways they can't control. But the question of who is to blame is not altogether clear. And, and Beam's refusal to make a political defense of New York social democracy facilitates that problem because he offers himself as the face of the problem for people to protest. But protesting Beam ends up not being the right target, sort of. He's hardly the person who is, I mean, he happens to be carrying all of this out, but he isn't the person with whom these plans and visions originate either. So, yeah, I think it's very interesting. And there's the, you, you mentioned the Emergency Financial Control Board, and I think this is actually also important to know coming out of the fiscal crisis that one of the, so, so what the, the state, um, New York State gets involved in trying to find some way to rescue the city. And the state also is actually concerned about its own finances. New York State had borrowed a lot during the 1960s and early 70s, too, and was, you know, that its own fiscal position was in danger, um, you know, especially if the city went bankrupt. And the state first creates the Municipal Assistance Corporation, which is a new entity that is authorized to borrow on behalf of the city. Its bonds are supposed to be backed by dedicated sales tax, so they're supposed to be secure investments. And then the, the Municipal Assistance Corporation, or MAC, Big MAC, as it was known, was supposed to then give the money to the city or loan the money to the city, but if it, but only if the city was um, kind of making the cuts that it needed to make. So it, MAC is created early in the summer of 1975, and many of the people who are associated with the fiscal crisis, like the financier Felix Roatan, who became, who was the the um, chairman of MAC and became in some ways one of the, the real public spokesmen around kind of interpreting what was happening in the city. And who came out of Lazard. Yeah, who came out of Lazard, Ferris, and was, was a, an, an interesting figure himself and, you know, kind of very, in many ways, you know, kind of just a conflicted figure. Uh, he had himself been, you know, involved in transforming the financial sector to be much more aggressive, much more kind of using the power of finance to change corporate culture in different ways. But he also was someone who had a certain kind of skepticism about kind of pure laissez-faire economics and was, he definitely was, he was not a, you know, he, he wanted to see or he had some idea of a reconstruction finance corporation-like entity that the federal government could create that would loan money to cities. But he was definitely, not, he, he, he clearly thought that the only way for New York to get out of the crisis was to adopt a sort of shock austerity program. He, you know, said that the, the only, you know, shock impact was going to be necessary. Maybe that, that might not, that's actually a quote from uh, someone else, not Rowerton, um, William Ellinghouse, the, the chief executive of New York Telephone. But um, who is also involved with Mac. But Roatan, you know, said overkill was going to be necessary to have the necessary impact that investors around the country wanted to see dramatic evidence that New York was changing its ways. Tuition at CUNY was an important part of that. 
So he was very committed to the sense that austerity was the only option forward for the city, even though at the same time he wanted, he continued to have some sense that greater federal investment was important down the road. So, you know, he kind of emerges as a spokesman for this vision. But Mac is not enough on its own to turn things around for New York. There actually is not really enough of a market for Mac's bonds at this point. And so in the, at the end of the summer of 1975, the state goes further and creates the Emergency Financial Control Board, which is a public entity that is granted final veto power over the city's budget. So it doesn't kind of go in and set the whole budget, but it is empowered to veto the budget if it's not making progress towards these benchmarks. And that, the Emergency Financial Control Board is staffed by um, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the mayor, the comptroller, and then three, quote unquote, public members who are chosen by the governor and who, in practice, were all executives from private corporations. Um, there was no labor representative. There was no community representative, even though there were, you know, kind of requests to have these types of representatives on the board. And this entity is, in some ways, kind of the most long-lasting social technology that comes out of the fiscal crisis. I think many different cities, states, counties, you know, Puerto Rico most recently, they have tended to develop these types of agencies in conditions of fiscal crisis. And La Junta. for the exact same reason that New York did, because it's meant to remove decision-making power about the budget from democratically elected representatives and put it in the hands of people who are, you know, the whole point is they're not supposed to be as responsive to the public. And so for that reason, they can be entrusted with carrying out these kinds of cuts. One article by a law professor about these these agencies described them as dictatorships for democracy. It was kind of actually a, praising them, but it was these entities are and I think that New York's was the first, it was an innovation coming out of New York that has since been widely adopted and replicated in other conditions of fiscal crisis. Austerity was justified on on economic grounds as a way to resolve the, the debt crisis, but what became targeted for austerity, you write, was, was thoroughly political. Imposing tuition on CUNY, for example, was important not so much as a budget line item, but because crushing the the belief that higher ed should be free was important symbolically for changing what government meant what was expected of government and i thought that that analysis in your book was really interesting it made me me think that by the same token i was connecting it to your argument that by the same token it seems neighborhood based fights were also symbolically focused because people saw the institutions being targeted for elimination, whether the the fire station in Northside in Williamsburg or the the hospital in Harlem, they they saw those as as symbolic of the planned elimination of their neighborhoods. What what had been floated as as this idea of planned shrinkage. Is it fair to say that a problem at play was that elite symbolic politics were were big picture while the resistance remained sort of parochial? And if so, why did it remain so parochial? I don't know if I would call it parochial exactly, because I think, as you say, one of the – a theme running through Fear City is the intense symbolism of these public entities and public institutions, that they are at once – you know, kind of vital and material parts of people's lives, but that they also contain within them a vision of society and of democratic life. So they, and it's not that these two things are totally divorced from each other, they materially make it possible, but they also stand for and represent something larger than themselves. And Yeah, I think that with regard to one of the things that is happening in the crisis, and it's is that the sensibility of from the standpoint of different elite actors, the sensibility of New Yorkers has to be changed. They have to be taught to expect less from their government, 
um, to expect less from collective institutions in general. And it's interesting. I, again, I think there's a, a funny, um, the things that was very interesting to me in working on this book is that a lot of the people who are making this case, I think during the, a lot of the elite actors who are making this case in the city in the 70s are less ideologically inspired than I at least would have expected that they aren't making this case so much because they believe in Milton Friedman or because they're directly involved in the conservative business organizing or political organizing that's going on throughout the 1970s. There are, in a way, there's kind of layers of remove or like there's a, the, the, the context of the crisis creates this dynamic where it starts to seem as though the only solution that makes any sense at all is these cuts. And so in a way, it, it is something about the, the, the immediate framework of the crisis where, and you can see this in someone like Rowerton, who has this ideology that is kind of at odds with what he's advocating for the city, and yet he's you know, holding these two things at the same time, that there's a incoherence. And, and yet at the same time, you can also see that the elite approach is being you know, it, it becomes scripted after the fact into this much more crystalline ideological account. You can see this, for example, in the writing of William Simon, who was Ford's Treasury Secretary and who was very hostile to the city throughout the crisis. One of the people who takes sort of one of the, the most hardline attitude within the Ford administration, saying the city should go bankrupt, it will teach it a lesson, it will show you know, it will demonstrate to other cities the futility of this kind of action. The market has already discounted it, so it won't even have very much of an economic effect, which was, I think, kind of a fantasy. So I, the, there was a, you know, he, after he leaves the Ford he becomes he becomes the first leader of the Olin Foundation, and he writes a book, A Time for Truth, where he talks about New York as liberalism and microcosm, and sort of takes a lot of his positions during this crisis and turns them into this, you know, highly ideologically charged account. So I think we can talk a little bit more about that and about neoliberalism later, but it may be that something similar is happening in the resistance too. That there's a the defense of these local institutions is very emotionally charged and meaningful. And the reasons why it becomes difficult to, you know, kind of transcend the defense of the local and build a more effective citywide mobilization, build a more effective national mobilization, those may have to do with the, I don't know, the levers of of power available to people more than that the elites are thinking in the big picture and people on the ground are just thinking about their own firehouse. I think thinking about the firehouse was a way of thinking about the big picture of the city. And even beyond, it was just much harder to translate that into effective political action at that moment. I found it to be a really interesting argument in, in your book, this observation that the people running the Emergency Financial Control Board and the Citizens Committee for New York, that these elites, you write, quote, almost everyone in this cohort agreed that budget drastic budget cuts were necessary to keep New York from bankruptcy, which they regarded as the ultimate nightmare. This desire for cuts was not the result of any abstract ideology or carefully planned political program to slash the state and promote the private market. They might not know exactly what to do, they might not know exactly how to do it, but they were sure that the only hope lay in giving power to people like themselves. And... So my question is, what does that analysis mean for this idea that neoliberalism really took hold amid the crises of the 70s because of what Milton Friedman called ideas lying around? And this is what something people are talking about a lot right now amidst the current crisis. What does that mean, given that these ide- these guys didn't seem to have many clear ideas at all? Is what, is what, you're, what you're saying that what you said a few minutes ago, more that these ideas become more important as the new hegemony is is consolidated, like in retrospect, what we see, does it become more important at the moment when, for example, Carter and Reagan alike are praising, end up praising New York for having imposed austerity? Or when the Manhattan Institute is founded um, in a, a kind of a sh- shortly after the fiscal crisis um, and starts to take the lessons of the crisis and translate them into policy advice for 
future New York City governments and also other governments around the country. I guess, yeah, one of the things that was really interesting to me about the fiscal crisis is uh, the number of people who define themselves as liberals and kind of continue to define themselves as liberals, even as they are participating in this austerity program. And they kind of say that they're doing so in order to help the public sector in the future and don't seem to have a cognitive dissonance about that. So I, I, I guess that's part of what I was trying to capture there. You know, I, I do think a lot of these people involved in these institutions, if you had kind of taken them a few years before the fiscal crisis, they wouldn't really have advocated the things that they wound up enthusiastically embracing as it came about. I think another part of it, though, is that there's a way, I mean, maybe, and, and, and I think this actually resonates a bit with my first book, which is called Invisible Hands, and which is about the role of business in building the right over the post-war years. And that book is much more about a conscious ideological program and strategy. But one thing it shares with Fear City is the the sense that the you know, but a part of this program, part of the strategy, you know, we, we can emphasize, we, we can get into a lot of the the niceties and sophistication of market theory and analysis, but a, a big part of it is actually rooted in the question of who has power, who should exercise power. And that may matter more for understanding what neoliberalism is about than, you know, kind of the particular programs or policy interventions. And so, you know, in that way, maybe the people who are the, the, the insight of the elite actors in the city during the fiscal crisis, that what has to happen is power should be removed from those who want to press for the city, the public sector, the federal government to preserve, develop, expand the social state. People, those people have to lose power, has to be consolidated among those who want to shrink those entities. I think that's, you know, it, it may be, it's another way of understanding what, uh, you know, what neoliberalism is at core. Definitely. Yeah. I, I think that one thing that I was thinking reading this is how the story you tell explains how this ideology that, that is supposedly, ostensibly, about a harsh market discipline as a general principle becomes one that after 2008 allows for the bailout of banks, but not underwater homeowners. The 2008 bank bailout did fail on the first vote, vote, but it ultimately did pass. And the fact that banks were ultimately able to secure a bailout while everyday people were denied and that today's corona stimulus package is so grotesquely weighted toward corporate interests, it all at the end of the day reflects that ideology, whatever its principled pretensions, that it's ultimately shaped by by class power and economics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your book says a lot about the origins of contemporary conservatism, but also, of course, because it's taking place in New York, which is then and now under democratic control, and then and now under a Republican president, it says a lot about how changes in American liberalism relate to changes in American conservatism and broader changes in American political economy. Where does this story fit in, which which begins in New York, not not with the crisis, as you mentioned, but prior to that with, with liberal Republican mayor John Lindsay, where does it fit into that that bigger story of the rise of the Atari Democrats who would become kind of morph into the new Democrats under under Clinton and and this this story about the relocation of the Democratic Party center of gravity to the affluent suburbs. Where does this story of, I guess, urban new liberalism fit into that? So I think one of the another part of this book or this story is wanting to encourage a different way of thinking about New York, that people often see New York as this center of left politics, or at least of kind of a very deep old school liberalism. And I think one of the lessons I was, one of the things that I thought about a lot while working on the book is the limits of that story, that New York actually becomes both 
the heart of a new kind of conservative politics, I think, coming out of the fiscal crisis, you know, one that is much more punitive, much harsher, and that, you know, kind of some of the politics of resentment and bitterness that come out of the fiscal crisis help to animate a new conservatism emanating out of the city. And also that, yes, it very much becomes part of a reorientation of liberalism. And I think this partly is because of the role of the fiscal crisis in national politics and some of that, the way that the crisis gets grafted into the the ideology of the New Democrats, that they also kind of see it as this moment of failure for the liberal state. There is a way in which the kind of larger underlying causes of the crisis are bracketed and shut off, and it becomes all about the pathologies of liberalism and the need to move the Democratic Party away from too close of an association with unions and with the civil rights movement and kind of the the, the welfare state more broadly. So I think, and I, there's actually another component to this, which I two two actually two younger scholars who I have worked with or been lucky enough to to work with have been that their work starts to flesh this out. Benjamin Holtzman, whose book will be on the kind of New York post crisis, is coming out fairly soon, and then also Dylan Gottlieb, who is a young historian writing about yuppies and the rise of the yuppie as both a, an archetype, but also the ways that the city, after the fiscal crisis, consciously tries to appeal to a new group of young urban professionals, and the ways that the shift towards finance in the city actually involves, in some ways, recruiting a new workforce to come to the city and that many of the people who who do come to New York at this point in the late 70s and early 80s are people who, you know, will actually become active in, for example, Gary Hart's campaign in 1984, and they start to make up a new constituency for the Democratic Party, one that is socially liberal, but fiscally conservative, and where a very important part of its politics is kind of hinges on turning away from big labor, the old working class, and the, the kind of a vision of a larger welfare state. So I think it, the crisis both kind of becomes part of the political imaginary in this way, but also within the city, you know, actually helps to the, the new population of the city is actually one that is becomes part of the new democratic consensus. And also a lot of the institutions that come out of the fiscal crisis, you know, a lot of what happens to urban liberalism afterwards, that it becomes much more oriented towards philanthropy, towards public-private partnerships, business improvement districts, PTAs that raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for particular schools. So there's a whole effort to harness private wealth and, you know, kind of bring it into the public sector, but in this you know, very segmented way. The park conservancies are another mechanism by which this happens. And I think, so there's actually, I think this this institutional change in what urban liberalism looks like. And even the way the High Line, I mean, it's beautiful, but it's also just like a real estate project. (laughs) Right. Yeah, no, I think there's another way, you know, that a lot of these, the park conservancies and the business improvement districts, they are kind of efforts to capture um, the resources of particular parts of the city and to get some part of the money of everybody in a particular neighborhood and then devote it towards things that will, you know, public improvements that also raise the real estate values in that particular neighborhood. So, yeah, very much so. Is is it fair to say, in terms of the legacy of the fiscal crisis, in terms of, of liberalism, that it's not that is powerfully evident not only with Mayor Cox reactionary, maybe even almost anti-liberal liberalism, Giuliani's law and order morality or or Bloomberg's technocratic one, but also and perhaps most tragically evident in the case of de Blasio, who ran as a progressive repudiation of his predecessors, but has ultimately been either unable or unwilling, or some combination of both, to challenge real estate dominance 
and the power of police. Yeah, no, I think it's actually it's I think it's it's very interesting how coming out of the fiscal crisis and and I would say you know, I, I think more historical work actually really needs to be done on the 80s and 90s in New York to fully understand this. But you can really, you can, I think, yeah, the, the, the power of, on the one hand, real estate, real estate development, and you know, that these people really organized coming out of the crisis. And in a way, you know, for people like Koch or the, the importance of improving property values as a way of financing the local state. Like that becomes the theory of what's going to save the city is finding ways to improve property values. And then that will enable you to raise more money in property taxes. And that will allow you to run an effective public sector again. The shape of liberalism is completely consonant with the need to favor the real estate sector. And I think this kind of underlies or is part of what opens up the the door to gentrification in different ways or the, the limited ability of the city to protect existing tenants and renters throughout. And yeah, it kind of winds up in, in a way it's been, what is the alternative vision to that? Someone like de Blasio has been caught within that. And on the other hand, the police union and the, the role of the police is also quite you know dramatic coming out of the fiscal crisis and there's actually a another um another historian Mason Williams who has been working a bit on police after the fiscal crisis and kind of shows for example how you know you know there's a, there's a funny you know the police were actually you know the police had intense cutbacks during the 70s as well you know things like the Rockefeller drug laws, for example, it's actually very hard for those to be enforced on the ground in New York. It takes a while before you actually see people in jail starting to rise, partly because their police aren't able to you know carry out the program that is being handed down to them. But then in the eighties, for Koch, fighting crime and supporting the police becomes part of his version of liberalism. And you can see this is partly, you know, about Koch and Koch's rejection of black New Yorkers and the kind of important role that hostility toward black New York played in Koch's politics and political appeal. But it also is part of his effort to say the liberal state can do something. So in a way, like, what can the liberal state do? Well, it can fight crime. And this is part of what it's like it's it's a it's an acceptable form for liberalism to take. So here too, there's a way in which like other functions of the state are being cut out or cut back or not viewed as legitimate any longer. But this is one that still is, and so both the kind of the institutional power of the police goes along at a deep level with this ideological reformulation of what liberalism is. And so then. Yeah, so they went up with someone like de Blasio, who just the traditions have been so hollowed out that it's hard to, go, you know, the the powerful institutions of the city constrain what he is able to do. And the cops' reaction, their the way they resist the fiscal crisis, really lays the groundwork right. for uh-huh. for this because they, along with firefighters, in a lot of ways, stood apart from other public sector workers and portrayed themselves as the true first responders, this this masculinized elite among public sector workers of sorts, which is something that we've seen play out in much more recent history in terms of fights over public sector unions in Ohio and Wisconsin. And in New York, this was most clear with the cops and firefighters Fear City campaign, which you, of course, take the title of your book from in these pamphlets that urged visitors and tourists to stay away from what they described as an apocalyptic hellhole, which was really a pretty reactionary argument that framed them as the thin blue line between society and chaos. Yeah, so they create the police union early in the summer of 75 when the first rounds of layoffs are being announced. Um, they create these pamphlets which feature a grinning skull on the cover, and it says, Welcome to Fear City. And then on the inside, it paints this this picture of 
New York as a, you know, in, in this pretty racist language about New York as a, you know, kind of a this frightening place. You shouldn't, you, you know, you shouldn't go out of your hotel after 6 p.m. You shouldn't take the subways. Whatever you do, you should stay away from the South Bronx. And they, their plan is to distribute these pamphlets at the airports, especially Kennedy, to tourists and especially international tourists who might be coming to New York. And when this plan is announced, Mayor Bean is apoplectic and obtains an injunction preventing them from handing out the pamphlet. And they challenge it. Eventually, the injunction is lifted, but they don't actually wind up doing it in great scale. Um, anyway, at that point, there are, but they do, however, you know, they take out big ads in the New York Times. They drive around the city with these sound trucks kind of blaring these messages about when was the last time you or someone in your family was mugged. So they definitely take on this, you know, they, they, the police union um, tries to argue against these layoffs at, by, by presenting itself as the savior of the city. I think that's absolutely right. And it does so. It's not really interested in, um, there's a kind of condescension on the part of the police union towards many of the other unions in the city, especially District Council 37. They view other, many other city workers as kind of paper pushers or, you know, they're not the real city workers the way that the uniform services are. So, yeah, they, they kind of, they, they, they claim to that. And I think, you know, I mean, it, it is true that this city at this moment, this is a moment of kind of rising violent crime in the city. Skyrocketing. A lot of crime statistics. Yeah, a lot of crime statistics are uh, subject to manipulation. But murder but is not. Rate, yeah. It is not, yeah. And so it's, you know, it, one of the remarkable things about the fiscal crisis, I think, in general, is that all these cutbacks are happening, you know, at a moment of intense social need, you know, when there really is a, a kind of rise in violent crime, there's a rise in arson and a fire epidemic, not which is not just about arson, but, you know, in neighborhoods like the South Bronx or Bushwick in Brooklyn. And it's a way, there's a way in which the cuts seem to fly so much in the face of what the city needs that makes them especially shocking. But nonetheless, you know, the police capitalize on that by spreading or trying to spread a different kind of fear, a fear of the city, a fear of violent crime, and and it's presented in these pretty heavily racialized terms. And, I, you know, I took the title of the book from that, but I think part of what I wanted to do with it is show how fear could be mobilized from above, not just from below in these ways. The cover of the book shows this picture of skyscrapers, and in part, part what I was trying to do with it was, you know, show how that, that fear could be part of a political program generated from above, you know, not just the fear of the city streets coming from the police union or coming from below. The crime rate, I think this is important to to underline, and there's a lot of important work, including from James Foreman Jr., including the actual rising crime rate as part of our analysis of the rise of mass incarceration as a more comprehensive left way to analyze the rise of mass incarceration. Um, But what was, and then, and so what's contingent within that is, is how how the increased crime is framed and responded to, and a critical juncture in this interpretive battle in New York that you write about is the blackout of 1977. And what w- what should be most remarkable about that, you write, is is how broad the cross section of people were, especially in in, in poor communities of color. How broad the cross section was of people who who looted, and what that should reveal about why so many considered theft to be so legitimate. But but doing that, in turn, would under, would require a close examination of what austerity had done to New York and to the poorest people in New York in particular. But, but, but instead, you write that the dominant response was for law and order and a description of looters as, as animals, animals nurtured by the liberal state. And that that, in turn, as, as you mentioned, really lays the the groundwork for this this urban neoconservative neoconservatism uh, exemplified by the by the Manhattan Institute which which then leads to to stop and frisk and and broken windows so i just want to step back for a moment and cuz you write quote the politics of fiscal crisis and retrenchment went hand in hand 
with a turn toward jails and prisons as the ultimate response to the problems of urban poverty. How did that happen? I think what I was, yeah, what I was trying to get at there is the kind of narrowing of political imagination that comes out of the crisis offers few alternatives for thinking about urban poverty except to except this very punitive framework that is focused on you know kind of punishing and removing poor people from society and yeah one of the things which was very interesting to me about the blackout one of, one of my favorite photographs actually in the book is this photograph of an elderly white couple <laughs> kind of genteely stepping out of <laughs> a grocery store, I think it might be an A and P, I can't remember, but they're they're stepping out of the store, kind of taking some of their, you know, the the groceries home with them. And I think it just it's it's not, you know, so many of the the images of the the blackout, the the property crime that follows the blackout are focused on young men of color kind of running around the city. But actually, if you read the descriptions of it and also some of the social science interviews that were done afterwards, it's just it's clear that a lot of the, you know, many, many, many people from different walks of life participated in this. And the question is, you know, kind of how and why and why did that seem legitimate? And how is it, you know, part of a broader sense of social need and unmet social need that comes out of the crisis? And I think actually one of the other themes about the blackout is this way that there's a sense that someone's been stealing things from the city, the sense that someone is taking things that had once been um, belonging to everybody in the city and removing them. And prior to the blackout, a lot of that, some of that political energy anyway, was directed at elites who were thought to have been responsible for austerity and for taking common things away from the city. In the blackout, the language of that really shifts so that it's seen to be poor people instead as the ultimate, you know, kind of villains taking things away from the city and from everybody. And so that, I think that's part of that shift to punitive politics that, that you were describing there. I'm Naomi Klein. You're listening to The Dig as well you should be, and you can support them on Patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our supporters at Patreon.com and by Haymarket Books, which has loads of great titles, perfect for dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Choice Words, edited by Annie Finch. With reproductive freedom under unprecedented attack, Choice Words takes back the cultural conversation on abortion. A landmark literary anthology of poems, stories, and essays, Choice Words collects essential voices that renew our courage in the struggle to defend reproductive rights. 20 years in the making, the book spans continents and centuries. This collection magnifies the voices of people reclaiming the sole authorship of their abortion experiences. These essays, poems, and prose are a testament to the profound political power of defying shame. As Molly Crabapple said of the book, silence, as much as anything, is why abortion is such an easy target in America. Stories save lives. We need women to say, shamelessly, I had an abortion. I'm not sorry. I'm not afraid. This anthology is a valuable contribution to this work. Choice Words, edited by Annie Finch. Out now from Haymarket Books. So crises not only open up different possible futures, but also different understandings of of the past. And you write, quote, The dynamics of the crisis created a sense that New York City's problems were entirely its own fault, which made it harder to see where power really lay at the level of the state and the federal government, which had created the policies that led to the unraveling of the city. How did that happen in the case of New York? And is it inevitable that crises lead to this 
invisibilization of the roots of the crisis? Is it possible for people engaging in politics to make those roots of crises hyper visible instead? So fiscal crises have this dynamic in particular because they focus attention on what the budget is going to be in the following year. And in a way, any government budget reflects a set of political decisions about what on and what the what the sources of revenue for government entity are. And in the case of New York, part of what you know in New York in the seventies, the kind of the, lar- the larger picture of the city has been influenced by, for example, federal policies that favor suburban development and that bring more wealthy and middle-class people out of the city and to the surrounding suburbs where they can effectively sequester their property taxes from the city, which is the source of their income and wealth. Or that some of the trade policies that make it easier for factories to leave the city and to go to to, to go overseas, that's in addition to the larger problem that many, you know, northeast and midwestern cities have of Um, the southern United States effectively becoming a low-tax, low-wage haven that companies can leave and go to even before they go overseas. Um, And then, you know, in addition to all of this, in the city itself, there are problems, the kind of pressure of real estate elites in the city in the post-war years towards, you know, kind of favoring um, using the central city for office development, white-collar work, real estate, that in turn helps also to accelerate deindustrialization. And then, you know, in addition to all of this, some of the, 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 the federal Medicaid or aid to families with dependent children, as these grow during the 1960s in New York State in particular, the way that those programs are financed, the 50-50 split. So you know, Medicaid is already 50, the federal government covers 50%. The state covers 50 percent. In New York City, actually, bore the, the split between the state and localities was also 50-50. So New York City was bearing 25 percent of its total Medicaid bill. This was extraordinarily high compared to other cities, other states around the country um, and had a profound effect on the budget. So all of these things are part of what's driving the imbalance, you know, the, 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 the problems that the city is running into. But the way that the fiscal crisis plays out is that it becomes the only discussion is the city's spending too much, the cuts have to be made. There isn't really a question about the broader context that is leading to this imbalance, nor is there a discussion of the benefits and the importance of the kinds of programs the city is trying to operate. There's not really a sense of that this is part of, or could be part of a vibrant dynamic, a vision of urban life as we clear. And so, you know, I think that's something that we've seen often in, in a way that's almost the, I would say, part of the function of a fiscal crisis is to, the way that it works is to give this sense of urgency and imperative and an absence of alternatives. And in a way, it frames all the questions so that there is no alternative to cutbacks. And I think the job of, I mean, I, so politically, I think the response to it, you know, has to, or kind of broadening the vision and understanding of what the problems are, what the nature of the problems are, and to insist, to, to kind of fight against that narrowing of vision. I think that can be very difficult to do in the context of fiscal crisis, but nonetheless, it's worth trying to do it even then. And beyond that, it's part of, it, it cre- I think it's important for people on the left to talk about how to finance the social state, a public sector in a sustainable way and what that looks like over, you know, over time so that you can avoid, I mean, in a way, kind of avoiding the fiscal crisis is the best solution to the problem of of the the narrowing of debate that it tends to involve, to enforce. You write that, that New York mayors in the 60s and 70s, quote, mobilized financial mechanisms to displace the conflicts the city confronted in the present onto the future. And so then this acute crisis of stagflation and the rise of conservative politics exposes this longer-running crisis. And I think this analysis of how debt and credit remakes, how they remake politics and economics across time is really, really 
important because in New York and elsewhere, what it ultimately does is change the power dynamics because public debt means that the future belongs to the creditors. And so not only is is the democratic economy that the left dreams of impossible without democratic control over credit, but but so too is just the very basic democratic polity promised by liberalism. What does that all tell us about the politics of credit? Yeah. So first, I think it, it does, it points to, I think that there there are a set of power relationships involved and in government debt. And it's important to not lose sight of those, that it can look as though debt is an easy way to expand government spending. But underneath that, someone owns that debt. And in particular situations, they can and will make the power that that ownership gives them felt in ways that can make democratic politics impossible. So I think that's the first lesson. The other is that there's something, I mean, I think that it, it is actually, I mean, I was very interested in the, the what the mayors were doing there, the kind of displacement of conflict to the future, that they kind of wanted to avoid a set of conflicts. And debt became a way to do that, you know, right away. But the conflicts didn't disappear just because they'd been moved off to some future point. They were still there, and eventually they would make themselves felt. Um, eventually the contradictions would become difficult to escape. So I think that's – there's I, the, the temporal framework of debt is always – you know, all, always involves this kind of displacement. And, yeah, the fiscal crisis definitely shows the limits of that, that you can't and, – and underneath the – in addition, the, these questions are not are not about about the budget, about the size of the state, about who pays for it. They aren't really just technical questions or questions that financial instruments can answer. They are political questions, and eventually, and in time, that politics will reemerge. So, I think that's another another point to take from it. In terms of the conflicts that were displaced, you write, quote, For much of the country, the New Deal order had become intertwined with the rise of suburbia and the flight from cities. New York was a reminder that there was also an urban version of this political and social sensibility, one that emphasized common spaces and public investment more than private greenswards of lawns and country clubs. Was what happened in New York, in a sense, and the conflict that was displaced from the 60s into the 70s, was that a contradiction between these two New Deal orders? And if so, is it in retrospect somewhat unsurprising that the New Deal order that prevailed was the suburban one? That's, well, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, it's, it's funny. I don't think I was thinking of it in quite those terms. I was thinking more just in terms of the question of who would pay for the local state in New York. But but yeah, on a deeper level, there is a, a tension between these two visions, two understandings of the New Deal. And I think that the book, or one of the things that I think I was trying to do in, in Fear City is to, there's a, a tendency, I think, now to, in, in some circles, to really emphasize the conservative elements of the New Deal. To el- and the to exclusions and, and segregations yeah, and divisions. Yeah, to emphasize the exclusions that, that involve, to emphasize the ways in which the um, federal housing administration buttressed residential segregation, um, to look at the ways in which uh, different social and economic benefits of the New Deal flowed disproportionately to white people and thus helped to reify racial segregation going into the past four years, and and also just the ways in which the New Deal becomes quickly grafted onto a military and commercial Keynesianism, and the, you know just the the politics of suburbia, which people often associate with a kind of property owning taxpayer politics that has within it, even at its you know even even when it's part of this post-war liberalism has within it pretty evidently something that's far more conservative. You know, while I, 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 I have a lot of sympathy for all of these critiques of the New Deal, but in a way, one of the things that I wanted to do in the book was to explore the parts of the New Deal that 
we're more genuinely progressive and are part of a left vision. Um, and in maybe in the, the, the New Deal itself contained a lot of tensions and was not easily, you can't, there, there, it, it, it wasn't just one thing either. So, yeah, I think the idea that there's a way in which these two contradictory visions of the New Deal get worked out, that's a really interesting one. And, a interesting, and, and, a, and, and yeah, yeah, certainly there are ways in which the support for suburban development, which comes out, you know, which is con- perhaps one legacy of the New Deal for homeownership and the flight from the cities, the investment, public investment that makes the highways possible, that actually acts against the you know, part of the support for the New Deal and the, the elements of it that are manifest in post-war New York. So we, we talked a lot about cuts to the social safety net, but as is clear from the history of the rise of racist policing and mass incarceration that followed the fiscal crisis, the state by no means just went away. There was plenty of money for cops in prisons, and there was also a lot of money for development. And you write about how under Mayor Beam that this really all got kicked off in a big way with the city giving 29-year-old Donald Trump, a real estate guy known for his racist practices, this massive corporate welfare package to redevelop the, the Commodore Hotel, which was this classic old hotel, into the garish Hyatt Regency that it is today. I, explain the shift from the politics of the city's welfare state being disciplined by mobile capital at the height of the crisis to this politics of the city doing everything possible to court mobile capital. This shift from prior to the crisis supporting workers to after the crisis claiming to support workers by supporting their bosses. Right. Well, I think there was a this shift in some ways. After the fiscal crisis, there is this sense that the state has to be, or the local local government, and you know some might say the entire you know kind of government at all levels, but certainly local government needs to be pared down to the basic essential services that it should provide: fire, police, sanitation, and that any money that's left over should go to economic development. And the idea is that only by encouraging economic development can you raise the money that you need for the state to do anything at all. And that's the lesson that a generation of city officials and liberals in general in the city take from the fiscal crisis. And and I should say, I think in the immediate aftermath of the fiscal crisis, there are actually, you know, it's not like these services continue. There, There were profound cuts to fire, sanitation, and even police. So that it's actually difficult for the rise of the kind of turn to kind of enforcing the Rockefeller drug laws in the city, the turn towards stop and frisk. That actually doesn't happen for some time after the fiscal crisis, partly because there isn't there there are actually there are fewer police on the streets for a while. But nonetheless, it's a sense that those are the essential functions they have to be taken care of, and that anything else, any other money that's left over should go for economic development. And and this is, I think, also associated with the idea that New York has been perceived as being anti-business in one way or another and needs to rescue and rehabilitate its image if it's going to have a chance to survive going forward. And this is, again, it's a little bit overstated. Lindsay had also actually tried to court corporate headquarters um, into Manhattan and had been involved in different kinds of different you know, kind of redevelopment projects of lower Manhattan that are happening during the 60s. Lindsay also tries to you know, create packages to retain industrial companies that might leave the city. So there's a, a bit of a prehistory to this idea, but it really gets newly energized out of the fiscal crisis. And one of the signal first major kind of moves in this direction is, yes, the one that brought Trump to Manhattan and that kind of led to the redevelopment of the Commodore Hotel in midtown Manhattan, right near Grand Central Station. And in The Art of the Deal, Trump writes about this, or his ghostwriter writes about it, as an example of his brilliance, that he is able to, he kind of looks at the streams of commuters and thinks, well, even if the city is falling apart, 
you know, this is still here. I can build a giant hotel here. And he kind of talks about this as you know, evidence of his own insight into the situation. But actually, the Trump deal worked out with the Hyatt Corporation. So it's not actually just Trump working alone there either. It's just the city is looking for deals like this that it can make. And what Trump basically is a major property tax break that Trump is able to obtain um, for redevelopment the property. Trump and Hyatt are able to get for redeveloping the property, a 40-year tax abatement that lowers property taxes for decades after the fiscal crisis. And but and the deal is criticized some at the time, partly from other hotel you know, owners who were angry about it, but also because it seems, I think, legitimately a little bit absurd for a near bankrupt city to be giving up this source of property tax revenue in a way. But the city celebrates it and trumps it and, you know, kind of the city describes it as the first step towards showing companies that New York has changed its ways, that it's not going to, you know, it's going to be more actively involved in finding ways to subsidize corporations, that it's going to be more friendly and generous to developers and to businesses of all kinds going forward. And that's, you know, that's how both the city officials and then also Governor Carey describe it as the project gets off the ground. And so I think this story is actually instructive also because it suggests the ways that the rise of Trump, certainly just in this case, like literally in the city, but maybe, you know, more broadly too, was facilitated by this shift in liberalism and by the the active participation of liberals who are, you know, kind of changing their relationship to business in ways that allow someone like Trump both to literally make his career in the city, but also kind of ideologically give the space for someone like that to come forward. And Trump also, he not only embraces and benefits from this corporate welfare development strategy and politics, but also plays a big role in pushing the the law and order reaction that protected that new system. Recall his calling for the reintroduction of the death penalty amid the, the Central Park Five situation. And so reading your book, I was thinking this is like strangely enough, one of those contingent moments where if it had not, if these things had not happened, Trump might not be president today, which in turn requires us to complicate the the origin story of, of Trumpist politics, that it can be found in part at this, this intersection of outer borough white racist reaction and Manhattan urban neoliberalism. Yeah, I think that's what's so interesting about it is that it, it kind of it combines these two. It's, you know, it's both a politics, which is about the corporate redevelopment of the, you know, kind of of, of Midtown and the efforts of people who are completely integrated into the Manhattan elite, their commitment to finding ways to do that, their desire to do that, you know, because it kind of rescues their version of the city, because they are themselves you know, people who own property that might be adjacent to something like the the Grand Hyatt. It's, it serves their interests both ideologically and in terms of their actual economic and immediate needs. So it's an alliance between that and this kind of the outer borough, much more revanchist, much more openly racist type of conservative politics. And in a weird way, Trump really bridges those two things. We, we kind of associate him now a lot you know he's often associated with the he's he's thought to represent a certain kind of working class racism white working class racism but he always has had this connection this profound connection to a more elite circle as well and i think it's it's not just trump you know the, the, the i'm thinking of koch you know the idea of reintroducing the death penalty and koch running for the mayoralty in 1977 saying he wants to bring back capital punishment, you know, for capital punishment or you. And Giuliani leading a police riot? Right, yes. Giuliani, under yeah. Dinkins? Right, right, right. I mean, as though, you know, the mayor of New York doesn't actually even affect the question of capital punishment, but it's kind of having that as such a symbolic central part of his politics. A lot of your book is about what was lost, but you do highlight what, what remains, which includes a high-rise public housing system that although it has a lot of problems and has been just really disinvested from, is still unlike anything that exists anywhere in the country and means that you have working class and poor people in the middle of Chelsea, 
you write that that what what does remain is a testament to to the struggles and that they weren't for nothing. What survived and what can we we learn from what what did survive? Well, I think that it's important to well just to back up for now, one of the things that was interesting about writing this book is that there's a lot of people today who are very committed to the idea that New York really has come back, has come back from the 1970s. The city is growing, its population is growing, it's becoming wealthier, people want to move into it. You know, part of what they mean is that, you know, kind of white middle class people want to live in the city again, families want to live here. Um, and so there was a strong, I, I, there were a lot of conversations that I had while working on the book about, oh, you know, well, luckily everything is so different now. New York has really come back. And, you know, I think one of the, yeah, I, I often, you know, I, I think it, it, it obviously very much depends who you're talking about, who has New York really come back for. Um, it's obviously very difficult to live in this city now as a working class person, even as a middle class person, honestly. Um, and so, it, and, you know, there are a lot of ways in which the city, I think, has become more difficult, more unequal uh, than it was in the period that I write about. And look at how the coronavirus is hitting Queens, places like Jackson Heights, where people right. are living. The kind of the, the, there are the, you know, the hashtag, you know, we're in this together. Well, are we really <laughs> in it together? This is not something that's affecting everybody in the same way. And even in New York, which has been this epicenter, uh, you know, of, of cases in the United States, the real, you know, the, the, the impact that it's having on communities of color and on poor people and working class people is just quite different from what it's having in parts of the city where people can easily afford to stay home and isolate themselves. So I, the, the improvements in the city are by no means, you know, uniform or universal. And I think that's important to keep in mind. But at the same time, I think it is also worth remembering that much of what makes New York distinctive even today are the same public institutions and investment and infrastructure that while battered, while fraught, while you know, far from what they should be, they actually still deli- they still are there and deliver some of what they might have promised to. So the subway system, um, for example, none, you know, all of its problems, it's had tremendous difficulties in recent years in particular, but still it is unparalleled in the United States. And that is part of what makes any resurgence or any success of the city possible. It's the only city in the United States with a real subway system. Right, it is. I mean, it's a remarkable thing. It's an incredible thing. Um, the public housing that you mentioned, I think, is part of what has enabled a, you know, it's far from what it, it could or should be, but it does preserve some measure of economic diversity in the city. You know, and again, like it's the problems, that it, it's, you know, the disastrous problems with public housing that have been much documented in recent years. So not to sugarcoat any of that. But nonetheless, that is land that could easily be turned into expensive apartments. And it is an accomplishment of sorts that it has not. And that the, the buildings are still there and could be improved with a different, you know, agenda and a different politics. CUNY is also still there. And even though there is tuition for it, it's much more affordable than many other educational institutions. And it continues to provide, you know, a remarkable education. There are, are brilliant scholars, you know, throughout the entire system at every school from community colleges to four-year schools to the graduate center. And this is also, you know, an extraordinary thing for a city to have and one that helps provide social mobility to hundreds of thousands of people. And I actually, one of the places that I wrote about in the book is, is Hostos Community College in the South Bronx. Um, Hostos was a new campus in the early 70s. And it was, you know, this is, this is at the moment of kind of massive disinvestment in the South Bronx. And it was, it represented an investment of the city in this neighborhood that was losing, you know, losing industry, losing people, was going through this fire wave um, that was truly frightening. And Hostos was kind of a bright light in the midst of all of that. It was at that point, it was a community college that actually was at that point bilingual. It was a unique program. There were very few like this, um, but half of its classes were taught in Spanish, serving the Puerto Rican and Dominican population of the neighborhood. And Hostos was threatened with closure during the fiscal crisis. There was a major mobilization to save the campus, both of professors and students 
and also of neighborhood people as well, a kind of coalition that formed. At one point, there was a three-week-long sit-in and occupation of the campus, and activists set up a daycare center in the president's office. You know, eventually the, the school, it was, it was saved. It was not closed. And it was, it actually, there was a subsequent mobilization to expand it. It had started in this abandoned tire factory and act, the student, you know, the, the, the group that had kind of come together to rescue the school at all continued pushing and they eventually actually got another building, a better building. And I went up there to do research. There's a very nice library and a lovely archive, which has a lot of the materials from this struggle there. And as you walk into the building, one of the first things that you see is a, a daycare center. There's a little kind of a small daycare center for host host students and faculty, which is kind of right there on the first floor as you walk in. And as I was walking past it, I, I thought, you know, this is really, you know, this is, you know, sort of in memory of the the people who worked to save this school in the first place in the 70s and to create it as a space where, you know, working families mothers with children could go to get an education. And here it is, it is still doing that now. So I think it's, you know, that a lot has been lost, but it's also, you know, there is this actual infrastructure that still exists and is also often, I think, overlooked in whatever, you know, resurgence of the city there has been in more recent years. It's interesting. I think in in moments of crisis like this, whether with 9-11 or COVID today, you see leaders like Cuomo so quickly turn to this bygone image of of tough and gritty working right. class uh-huh. New York. Suddenly New York isn't the fancy people in banks. It's the swaggering street smart city that can take anything. And and that seems in turn related to this thing yeah. that you note, which is the incredible nostalgia nationwide and I suppose even globally for right. 1970s. New York, we see it in movies. We remember the punk, hip hop, graffiti. What do you make of of this nostalgia and all of its various iterations? I wonder if it's misplaced in the sense that should our nostalgia instead be for the 1960s social democratic right. New York? Are we stuck because of the neoliberal city's triumph between these these two false choices of the dystopian neoliberal president present or the dystopian disinvested austerity crisis past? Right. Well, that's a really interesting point. I think that the one I was very, I think I was very surprised and heartened by in the response to Fear City was how much interest and excitement there was in this image of post-war New York and the the vision of a different kind of city that you can see there. And I actually think, you know, in some ways, both Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and in a different way, Bernie Sanders and his campaign may have brought some of that that vision of the city back into political life and debate. It's just things like the free tuition. It's just this was something that wasn't just a, a fantasy. This actually did exist. And so and Bernie I benefited think, from it. Right. And Bernie benefited from it and was actually, a, you know, a product of that world in, in certain ways. You know, at the same time, I guess I would say two other things. One is I I think it's important not to be too nostalgic for that world, that despite you can kind of isolate and bring out its utopian promises, but they were far from from realized in many ways. And it's just important not to have a politics that's too focused in nostalgia around them. There were too many divisions. It's not a world we can simply inhabit as a space for future imagining. So I I would caution against just simply being nostalgic for it in a way. And the second is, I think that the appeal of 70s New York is partly... Why does taxi driver make us feel good? (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of... I think partly people are drawn to it out of a sense, because it, it, it seems like the last moment before the rise of this new thing. So it is a moment of things being kind of stripped down to their bare essentials and where you can see how they actually work and who the system works for. And you can maybe out of that insight, get a certain clarity and even a sense of freedom or possibility to imagine it developing in a different way. So I think that's part of why people are drawn to it, is that it's the the moment 
that precedes the advent of what now looks like this very complete, developed, sanitized, political, economic, yeah, ascendant, ideological formation. And looking at the moment before that comes into existence can give you just a sense of how, how con- it, it makes you feel again that it's contingent and could have, you know, could develop in a different way, could go in a different way. There's a kind of freedom out of that feeling of things falling apart and not being built up again yet. Yeah, it's like dangerous, but also seems free, yeah. free of the power of police, free of the power of the real estate market. Right. Finally, you wrote recently in in the New York Times about this the stigmatization of New York as a liberal, diverse, cosmopolitan incubator of of the virus and how that really recapitulates the conservative anti-New York sentiment that was really pervasive all over the country in the 1970s and that bolstered the imposition of austerity onto the city. What are you seeing now? And in our response to the crisis on the left, what can we learn from what happened then? You know, one thing to learn from it would be the importance of not getting backed into narrow interpretations of what the crisis is. And I think the crisis in New York, the the way that the coronavirus is playing out in New York today, you know, there's obviously a very immediate health crisis, but it is part, it, it, it exists because of a deeper disinvestment in public institutions, in public health, in public education too, in a way. And I think on the left, it will be helpful going forward to remind people of the structural reasons that this public health crisis could emerge as it has, and that that will be helpful both for thinking about, you know, kind of preventing this kind of thing from happening again, from trying to ameliorate the profound damage that it is doing, and in giving people a sense of the courage and resources to, you know, contend with this, you know, this terrible situation. So I guess that's one, you know, to, to, to try to, to think about or to, to give people, you know, part, uh, this kind of crisis can sort of freeze you so that you, uh, I mean, it can, can cause you to become frozen so that it's impossible to see beyond the very immediate future. And I think, you know, in a way, reminding people to keep their wits about them and to try to cope with the inevitable fear and panic that this kind of thing generates by thinking about it and thinking about its history, thinking about where it comes from, and thinking about the power relationships that determine how it is experienced. I think that will actually be helpful to people, you know, in immediate terms in grappling with the crisis, as well as in building, a, a tr- you know, trying to build something better out of it. I think the second thing is that, you know, to remember, and I, I, you know, the very reason that New York is demonized or is is viewed as this, you know, kind of treated as this incubator for the virus, its density, its connection of people to each other, um, that those actually are lessons that New York can share with the rest of the country now and with the rest of the world that our social infrastructure and the, the, the types of communities that it helps to create are what can provide people the solidarity and sense of common purpose that, again, is what the country and the world need to grapple with, a crisis of this sort, and with other crises, too, going forward. So I think kind of holding on to that and celebrating what is distinctive in this city and in the urban environment. Yeah, I think that that lesson comes from the fiscal crisis in a way, too, but it it certainly has been on my mind now. Well, Kim Phillips Fine, thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a, a this has been a pleasure. Kim Phillips Fine teaches American history at New York University. She is the author of Fear City, New York's Fiscal Crisis and the Rise of Austerity Politics, and Invisible Hands, The Businessmen's Crusade Against the New Deal, 
Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that humans are at last compelled to face with sober senses their real conditions of life and their relations with their kind, while other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinators are Julia Rock and Zachary Nin. Our senior advisor is Thea Rio Francos. Check out our vast archives and join or start a Dig book club at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio. And please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. And if it's on iTunes or wherever, please take a moment to rate and review us. That all ostensibly helps introduce us to new listeners, which, if you love The Dig, is inherently a good thing. But what truly helps do that is you telling friends, family, strangers about why you like the show. Please make propaganda for us. And do, last but not least, find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this operation up and running strong. Even a few bucks is huge. Mm-hmm.